The first descendant has a campaign you need to complete before you get access to the hard mode, where the real grind begins. The game has a variety of descendant characters, each with different skills and playstyle. Additionally, descendants come in different elements, known as attribute, fire, chill, electric, and toxic. Some descendants rely heavily on skills whereas other descendants rely heavily on weapons for DPS. Whichever playstyle you choose, you will need to sink your teeth into the loot grind to make your descendant more powerful. My name is Weds, welcome to the first descendant and my beginner's guide after over 540 hours gameplay. It is my assumption, by the time some of you watch this video, many things will have changed. For that reason, I'm going to try to stick to the basics as much as possible. Now, when it comes to Nexon and the developers, I suggest you focus on what they are doing with this game, rather than their bad behaviors in the past. Since the launch of this game, they have been very responsive in taking feedback from the players, even to the point where the hardcore players feel some kind of ways. I believe Nexon needs to adjust the game to make it enjoyable for all players. Give the hardcore players something to challenge themselves so that they don't feel left out. In any case, if you're new to the first descendant or are interested in trying the game but still on the fence, this guide will hopefully give you an idea what you're getting into. I enjoyed this game and with so many hours under my belt, I would like to share my knowledge of the game with you. First thing first, there is no need to say the first descendant is a looter shooter. But what is a game in a nutshell? Well, you need a descendant with weapons and skills that rely heavily on modules to achieve the power fantasy. When you first start the game, you get the option to choose between three characters for free. Look at their info and decide which one fits your style. However, if I had to do this all over again, I would definitely start with Lepic instead of Viesa. Not that Viesa is a bad pick, but Lepic is one of the best and fastest at killing bosses. That is my opinion based on my experience with this game. Besides all of that, the game also offers you the option to purchase other characters in the shop if you don't want to grind for them. There are regular descendants and there are ultimate descendants, with the latter being more powerful and have access to exclusive modules. In the microtransaction shop, they have something called Descendant Ticket Package. Different package for different prices. I have a video about this on the channel if you want to find out how the Descendant Ticket Package works. However, my advice, if you're going to purchase any Descendant, there are two that are pretty much a must have if you want to have a better experience in this game. They are Enzo and Sharon. Both characters are essential to farming important materials in this game. Enzo will make opening vaults a piece of cake. And Sharon, she's the only character in this game right now that can go invisible. And you need invisibility to infiltrate certain outposts in order to acquire certain patterns a resource used to farm ultimate descendants and ultimate weapons parts for research or crafting. Anyway, if you don't have these two characters in your arsenal of descendants, you will be lacking in some ways. Or you can rely on strangers or friends to help you out if you don't have these characters. To be clear, you don't have to buy them because you can farm for them. But if you're going to spend any money, any money at all, on any descendant, early on, Enzo and Sharon are the best investments. Now, I think you know enough about descendants, but how do you make yourself more powerful in this game to live out your power fantasy? Well, as I previously stated, you need a descendant with weapons and skills that rely heavily on modules to achieve the power fantasy. There's one simple rule I believe you should follow to achieve better success in this game. That is, you need to focus on investing in a good weapon first 
any descendant second. The reason being, you can use a powerful weapon with any descendant, and that will carry you throughout your entire journey. As a side note, one of the most powerful weapons that can carry you from the campaign and beyond is given to you for free very early on. This weapon is called Thunder Cage. But before talking about investing in a powerful weapon and a powerful descendant, you must know that both your character and your weapon can be leveled up with experience to a maximum power level of 40. You can speed up the process by equipping experience boosters and weapons proficiency boosters. Those are sold in the shop as convenience along with a lot of other things. At level 40, your descendant will have a max capacity of 50 to slot your modules. All these capacities derive from the mastery rank system as you level up. The more mastery ranks, the more benefits. But again, at level 40, the max capacity will be capped at 50. However, since 50 capacities will limit the amount of modules you can slot in your descendant, the game gives you a way to increase your modules capacity to 80. And on top of that, you can add an extra 5 capacities for a total of 85 if you catalyze your sub-module slot in your descendant. The same goes for your weapon, with the only exception that weapons do not have a sub-module slot. Therefore, Weapons can only go up to 80 capacities. That said, to increase your capacity to the max, you need an item called Energy Activator, which can either be farmed by playing the game or purchased via the shop. Now let's talk about how to invest in a powerful weapon and a powerful character. This process will require you to add multiple crystallization catalysts to your descendant or weapon. Each time you add a catalyst to your weapon or descendant, they will reset to level 1. Therefore, you will have to re-level them up to level 40. And that happens for every catalyst you decide to add. It's a tedious process, and I think it's stupid, but they give you different ways to level up your characters with some methods faster than others. Now, just like the energy activator, crystallization catalyst can be found by playing the game or purchased via the shop. Why do you need a crystallization catalyst? You need a crystallization catalyst because a crystallization catalyst is used in exchange for a module socket type, which will lower the capacity cost of the module you slot. Every module comes with a capacity cost ranging from 0 to as high as 16 after you enhance the module, which is a way of making the module more powerful, thereby making your character or weapon more powerful. You can enhance your module by visiting Cillian. This will cost you gold and Kuiper shards. These are the two most important currencies in the game that you will need to farm for. Additionally, Every module also comes with a specific symbol, also called a module socket type. Basically, it's a polarity system. When you match the polarity of a module with the polarity of a module slot in your descendant or weapon, the capacity cost will be cut in half. This means an enhanced module with a 16 capacity cost will be cut to 8 when you match the polarity. With all that in mind, your descendant has 12 module slots, and your weapon has 10 module slots. The majority of some of the best modules in the game, when enhanced, will have a capacity cost of 16. Therefore, if you don't use a catalyst to decrease the cost, you will not be able to have a powerful character. Now, as far as which weapon to use, though Thunder Cage is easily accessible and one of the best weapons in the game, I would recommend you invest in a machine gun as soon as possible. As the making of this video, the best machine guns are the Tamer and the Enduring Legacy. The Tamer is a legendary machine gun and the Enduring Legacy is an ultimate type machine gun, the more powerful version of weapons in the game. 
you have to grind harder to get Enduring Legacy since it's an ultimate weapon. Therefore, I would highly recommend the Tamer to be your starting point until you can get Enduring Legacy. That out of the way, you need to add modules to your favorite weapon and your favorite descendant. That is how to get powerful in the game. After going through the campaign, you will have a lot of modules at your disposal. But for the best ones, you will have to grind for a good amount of time and hopefully RNG is on your side. It's important to note that the drop rate for the best modules in this game can be quite discouraging, but they are not impossible to obtain. Many items you need to grind for will tell you the drop rate of said item, that way you know what to expect. Now as far as Descendant is concerned, your power will comprise of not only modules, but also reactors and external components. Every Descendant in the game can kill bosses solo. However, I recommend you invest in one that can kill bosses not only solo, but also faster. That way, you don't have to rely too much on public lobbies. In Intercept Battle, there is a timer for how long you need to kill a boss. If the time runs out, you fail. So keep that in mind. Additionally, solo boss fights are easier because the boss's health is lower. Whereas in public matchmaking, the health pool of the boss is increased based on the number of people in a party. With that in mind, as a new player, choose your descendant wisely. For me, before I invested in the ultimate Lepic, I had to rely heavily on matchmaking to kill bosses. But once I had ultimate Lepic, I was able to solo all the bosses that can be soloed. Not all bosses can be soloed. As the making of this video, the game requires you to go in with a fire team for some of the later bosses in this game like Hangman, Gluttony, etc. To be clear, I'm not saying you need to invest in Lepic. There are other descendants in the game right now that are as powerful as Lepic when it comes to killing bosses solo. But you just need to invest in one of them, especially if you are a solo player. All that being said, having one good descendant and one good weapon will go a long way. However, the game is designed for you to acquire multiple descendants. At least you should try to get one descendant for each element. Why you ask? There are these missions in the game called Void Fragment. They are of a certain element such as Known Attribute, Fire, Chill, Electric, and Toxic. You will use those missions for farming modules, weapons, and other important materials. You can only activate these missions if your descendant is of the same element. It's a stupid system in my opinion, but it is what it is and I still enjoy the game. So bear that in mind, it's in the game and it will be part of your grind for some of the best loot. Speaking of some of the best loot, some of them require an item called Patterns. You use patterns in a reconstructive device, which can only drop after you kill a boss. It could be a boss from Intercept Battle or a Void Fusion Reactor boss. Void Fusion Reactor bosses can be found in every region, and you need the materials that you farm from Void Missions or Defense Operations in order to activate those fusion reactors. Why is all that important? All that is important because this is how you will earn some of the best loot in the game. Such as ultimate descendant parts and ultimate weapon parts you will need to research or craft it. That is basically the game loop. Your end game consists of grinding for regular or ultimate descendants, ultimate weapons, kuiper shards, and gold. In any case, as a beginner, I think that is all the basics you need to know about the first descendant. I hope this video was informative. Thank you so much for watching. See you guys in the next one.